I was preparing for this class looking for links for fashion and technology, which you've done also, and I'm sure you've come across Charm Technologies because it keeps coming up. It's probably the first 20 links that you hit on. Um, we are very lucky to have Alex Lightman, who's the CEO of Charm Technologies, to come here and give us a talk. He lives in LA, but he is all over the place, and he'll tell us a little bit about that. He wrote the Brave New Unwired World, the Digital Big Bang and the Infinite Internet, which I had in my library. So after we had our discussion he, over email, he wrote to me saying that he's actually interested in promoting this book. And I thought, wait a second, I have this book. <laughs> so <laughs> this is a really nice way to see how interconnected we all are. And one of the thing about networks is that there are people who are considered kind of connectors, and they're actually very important in our culture. And people like Alex Lightman would be called connectors because he has huge experience in putting out information about his thoughts, including uh, writing a hundred articles on the subject of technology and culture and society and in many different aspects, including economy. He has uh, put on over 100 shows on fashion and technology in 20 countries. And he's also connected, again, speaking of connections, he's connected to the UC system through uh, Cal IT2, which is um, a huge technological connection, again, between UC San Diego and UC Irvine, looking at pervasive computing and the future of technology. So with that, I would like you to give a very warm welcome and a grateful welcome to Alex Lightman. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me, Alex Lightman, CEO of Charm Technology. I'm the guy. I'm going to show you pieces from four different videotapes today. So the first one is the fashion show that I produced here in LA that was part of Internet World. And I thought that you might find this interesting because um, I'm happy for this to be an interactive presentation. You're welcome to ask me questions. This is uh, uh, one of the people who worked on the fashion show just did a videotaping. And I show you these logos at the beginning for a simple reason. This is uh, the head of Internet, Internet World's all of their trade shows. But all of these people paid or traded something to be there. I generated uh, about $700,000 in cash and barter from doing the first show before I'd ever done a fashion show in fall of 1999. And we ended up doing another 25 or so shows. Each one of them, we did about six different fashion shows per show. But these shows, uh, can you turn on the sound a little bit? Uh, each of these shows uh, was done with sponsor support. We did them in New York, LA, Minneapolis, Tel Aviv, London, Paris, Stockholm, Berlin, uh, Seoul, Korea, Beijing, and uh, Hong Kong, China. And all of the shows had a similar thing. They had a traditional, you know, they had a catwalk. They had a big screen here in the middle that we could use to show the people. And a sort of a, a matrix derived kind of special effects in between them. And it still gives me chills to hear the music for it and see it. And then what I'm going to show you is some of the publicity that came out of the show, what other people talked about. And I'm going to show you a thing, uh, some futuristic stuff, biological related stuff. Bad. So what they would do is that, yeah, that really uh, but the, the idea is that we would show about one third working devices, device. one third things that were in the laboratory, and one thing, third things that were completely conceptual prototypes. And what we would often do is say, you know, this is how you would get six billion people online all the time. So this is one of the very first wearable computers. This is the private eye here. This is the first Twiddler, Twiddler One, and then this is the this is a 286 um, Intel-based computer. And uh, basically, you know, when you have these things, you have to either fit them to your head. Yes, you're laughing. Why are you laughing? Oh, is it, why, what does it make you think of? Oh, okay. <laughs> what, twiddling with yourself or something? Uh, yeah, I've always thought it's a funny thing. 
Uh, these, we have about 10 different designers, luscious and so on. I mean, there, there's a little brochure about it. But, uh, um, and so these are little things from orangutan, which basically you put palm on. But the idea is that if you can make something wearable and make it hands-free, people will use it. And here's something I'd like you to, to take a note of. Um, there's something that academics have found called the two-second rule. And that is if you can access something within two seconds, for instance, my glasses, I can see through them instantly. I can check my watch, see that it's 20 after 2. I can see all that instantly, within two seconds. The, if it takes more than two seconds to access something, then your usage of that thing falls off exponentially. So you may find a lot of people using PDAs. How many of you own a PDA? Put your hand up higher. How many of you own a PDA but don't have it with you? Okay, there's typically, you know, that you may find in any technology audience about two-thirds of the people own a PDA, but maybe only one-third or fewer will have it with them. And there's a name for that. It's called device relinquishment. It means that you buy it and you start to use it, but it's, well, it's a little bit cumbersome and I'll just leave it behind. I don't have to do it today. And so the idea of making things wearable is that they're accessible very, very soon. And the idea of doing these fashion shows and making them sleek and putting them on attractive women and attractive men is to create a positive first impression. You know, the whole thing that you've probably heard of about baby ducks and baby geese, like goslings, I should call them, that when they see, the first thing they see, that's their mother. Well, when Thad Starner was starting to wear his wearable computer, people used to cross the street to get away from him. And he told me a story once, which is that he was running late for a meeting with the Air Force, and he was going to ask them to pay for his PhD, $60,000 of, of help and assistance for Thad. And he ran by these two guys with crew cuts in the hall, and one of them said, what the fuck was that? That, excuse my language, but I'm just being clinically accurate here. And so he ran down the hall, got to the meeting, and a few minutes later these guys came in. They had been lost. And of course, it was the two guys he had just passed in the hallway. It was very embarrassing for both of them. He did get the scholarship, but the point was that it isn't, you know, it isn't who was that, it was what was that. Because it's like you're a freak if you're wearing wearable computers. So I thought if I'm going to go out here and make a company that does wearable computers, I have got to make it a cool thing. I've got to make it the norm. And so as a result, this is something that I designed, I actually have a design patent for. Um, as a result of this, this may sound funny to you, but there was never, ever a real live fashion show with wearable computers. MIT did two things with skits, where people would perform, dance, and so on, on a stage. These were the first ones with a fashion show. Now, Comdex, Consumer Electronics Show, the Cellular Telecommunications and Information uh, Association Show, and three other shows I know have copied this fashion show idea as the way to present technology. And so to some extent, this is the invention of computers as fashion items. You know, computers used to be the size of rooms, then the back in the, um, and in the early 40s, uh, this is the, by the way, the Mars vest. This is the Defense Department's bulletproof vest. So if you get, you know, have a plane that's down in the desert somewhere and you have to quickly go in and fix it and you're taking fire, <laughs> someone's after you with that. Uh, my co-founder of Charm is in Playboy this month, the March issue, and she was claiming that she was wearing the Mars vest as she went into China and that they arrested her and put her in Chinese prison. In fact, it's ridiculous. You, you wouldn't be wearing a Mars vest as you went onto a plane anyway. The thing is solid metal. But just in case you ever come across that and are reading it totally for the articles, uh, you would find that basically that's what the Mars vest was. This is, believe it or not, a poultry inspection system that was set up. And in fact, the, the if you were going for the uh, initial ISWIC, International Symposium of Wearable Computing, you would, uh, you would find that all the emails went to PoultryNet because it was the University of Georgia doing it. So it's very funny to me to take something that's used for, for checking out chickens and to put it in a fashion show. But that's, this is uh, the symbol system. This is the best-selling wearable computer anywhere. This is 100,000 of these have been sold, and they have a ring scanner. They're scanning barcodes in warehouses, so they say, okay, uh, we need to have 50 boxes of those 50 cent. You know, the new CD is out from 50 cent. Um, get rich or die trying. Well, then you'll go and, you know, scan the barcodes, and you'll find the right place in there. And then this is a Zybernaut system. Um, and there, there's a little camera on that, so on carrying that around. But the idea with these shows is that this is a uh, blood pressure heart monitoring system. 
that you would do if you were working with people in foreign countries. The U.S. military, I, I've always wanted to have a nurse like that, and so um, when I had the show, I was able to specify whatever clothes I wanted to have for the show. Um, you would have enjoyed the Sydney show. It was almost, because it, it was right before the Olympics, I had the excuse to put the whole thing as, uh, as basically um, swimsuits. So that was very funny, though. When we, had the, we were trying to get models in Sydney, and all these women would come in, they were injured models. Oh, yeah, got into a bar fight last night. <laughs> And my guy was rooting and louting. I had to take him out. And I got bit by a shark, see? And they had this big, giant bandage on their hands. I had to go through lots of models in Sydney to find the few that would actually look good with the bathing suit. This is one of, uh, one of those things that um, it's actually a little tiny camera in the glasses, though nobody's actually looking at the glasses. Um, and so the idea of the show is to basically, by, if you take attractive men and women, mainly women, and you put technology on them, it became news. You know, they say MIT Media Lab spinoff would do it. Notice the technology. And so this is how, this is uh, now a textbook case at Harvard Business School about how to market computers. Uh, it was one of the 15 cases to join the core cur curriculum. Yes. Yeah, sure. But when somebody's giving a talk, you don't you don't have to use but right right in the beginning. I mean, there's no but. There are 60 different items in here. Charm does a system for the blind, but blind people don't need cameras. They don't use cameras because they, they can't see them. But what they have is something oh, we have called uh, cyber crumbs. We put little tiny devices out which have infrared and RF and which can uh, actually bounce off the walls or bounce off the person and help the blind person. Almost any application you can think of. Uh, one for the deaf we have is a hat. There's a jungle hat, in fact, which is putting down infrared here. And then you do American Sign Language, and it will go and speak with 98% accuracy for uh, uh, unless you, you know, if you're using normal conversation. Uh, it'll say it out of a shoulder pad. So you could have a deaf person who's actually speaking with their hands like that. Um, you asked about environmental thing. A lot of the wearable computers have, uh, uh, I like these, these are stegosaurus pants. <laughs> um, the, a lot of the wearable computing things are used to be, are going to tie into sensor nets. Uh, they're going to take temperature, pressure, um, humidity, all these kind of things and, and give you a real time assessment of what's happening, what's going on. Um, so the uh, general thing though about the show is that if you're going to be getting your, making clothes, if you're going to be doing fashion, you have to find somebody who's going to, to look at it. You have to going to get some publicity. And if you want publicity, you need to do a show of some kind. That's why people do fashion shows. And if you want to do a fashion show, it costs money. For instance, this show costs about 150000 to do. But if you can get television coverage of your shows and show that they, you continually will get television, then you can sell those logos. Because notice the one thing that stayed the same for that is the logos on the stage. And if you're the organizer of the show, you get your logo up there as, for free. But if you're another company, then you have to pay for it. So that's to some extent, I have given you one of the things that can help you, whatever designs that you have, is to think about how you do the shows. The problem comes though is that you have to have some kind of, something that's new and novel and not obvious, and that's not just fashion. And the problem with these shows that they've done, that the copies that haven't done well, you probably never heard of them because they get no publicity whatsoever. And part of the reason is they had, they had, they brought nothing new in. Now this, this is something that I came up with that IBM was, was uh, flattering enough, me enough to copy, which is internet connected jewelry. In fact, that's just a prototype. But basically I wanted to make something that was like reminiscent of the Borg. If the Borg from Star Trek had jewelry, what would it look like? And so that's to some extent what these things are. And the idea is that if you can get a computer or cell phone, PDA type functionality, and put it into rings, watches, pendants, brooches, bracelets, belt buckles, uh, then you have the ability to have computing power anywhere and everywhere you go. And there's actually, what's so funny is it seems very impractical, but it's the only way that we're going to get the internet to the poorest people in the world. People who are in India, people in China, in villages, because once you shrink it down to something like this, most of the money 
that will be charged will be for the gold or the silver or the design. You know, a Gautier design will be what you pay for. And the electronic component of it will be a very small part of it. The price, average price that computers are being sold for is shrinking all the time. And so by putting things in so that you can charge for the fashion, charge for the style, charge for the color, you have a much greater ability to maintain high margins. That's one of the things that why fashion was invented. Fashion was invented to help get us out of a slump. The fashion system we enjoy today was to get us out of the Great Depression by saying, okay, how do we get people to feel like they need to buy new clothes? Because really you only need a couple shirts, a couple pants, one or two pairs of shoes, all that stuff. But that's not enough to keep an economy going. What you want is you want an economy where people buy hundreds of shoes, hundreds of pairs of pants, shirts, all that stuff. And that's to some extent what fashion does by getting you to go and buy whatever the fall or the spring and the season is. Well, what if you could get people to do that with computers instead of holding a computer? Um, there's a term for, for a company buying a computer and then just using it till it's gone. That's called sweating the assets. Like, you know, imagine a person working in the sun, digging a ditch or something like that. And you basically make it work. The idea of this is the opposite, that you get people to want to have uh, bracelets, pendants, brooches, a friend of mine who's working on IPv6, IP version 6, says that in the future that we'll have, the average person will have 100 internet addresses. And part of the reason is that uh, people will have the, all these different kinds of devices on them. And these devices can also communicate with each other. And some of them may be single purpose. You may have that something on your wrist which just measure, measures your blood pressure or your heart rate. And you may have something in your glasses which is just doing video recording. And you may have something that's near your ear that, uh, that acts as a microphone or something that's around your, you know, your, your throat that would be taking what you're saying even when you speak very softly and it will be transcribing it so that you have a record of all the things that you talk about. So, any questions so far? Okay, so what I'm going to do now is to uh, change this and go to the next tape. Uh, I want to go to this one here. So, just one question. Yeah, go ahead. These clothes, are they marketed? Do, do you, where would you buy some after the show? Where well, I think that, that everybody has things that they did right, and things that, things that you do that you plan to do, and they go right, and things that you don't plan to do and they go right, and things that you should have thought of. And one of the things that I should have thought of was selling the clothes that I did in the shows on our website. But, you know, we were a technology company and I didn't think that our investors would like it if we're, we're selling, tech, you know, clothes because, oh, you have to focus. But, no, we didn't sell the clothes. And we, didn't, in fact, we didn't even make, um, you know, emphasize the clothes because it would be very easy for the clothes to overpower the technology that we were trying to sell, like the Charm at wearable computer, which is sitting in the bag next to you. So what happened to all the clothes? <laughs> well, the, we... They went back to the people. They went back to the designers. We're not like William Shatner, who insists on keeping everything he ever wears. I mean, we would, you know, we we get them on a loan basis. Though some of the clothes, I, I can I can tell you, after taking them all over the world and having them on the show, some of them got ripped to shreds. You know, we were holding them together with you know with with bailing twine and safety pins. Um, do any of you know why all models are all all thin and tall? Anyone know why? What's that? Right, because we have one, you know, one dress or something, and they all have to fit it. And you know, if they don't have those those dimensions, they may stretch it out so that you know somebody else can't wear it in the future. So it's it's. Uh, but it, they still put a lot of wear and tear on them because they're taking these things on and they're taking them off like really fast. You know, they're walking out like this and stuff. But as soon as they get back behind the thing, they're like that, moving all around like you know, looking like something out of the Road Runner. Okay, this is the next tape. So this is something which shows. And then if you could put on the sound. Special 48 hours on the brink of a new millennium. This is right before 2000. So it was the, the new millennium kind of thing. And this is funny. Our images were put into Times Square on the big screens. They'll show it in a second. Well, this is nationwide. But yeah, these were images from the New York show by coincidence. There, on New York. That was from our very first fashion show. First century fashion show. That's the image that, that was replicated more than any other one. Where chic 
when they had to come up with an image for the new millennium, one image out of 10,000 for CBS, that was the image, those three women together in the catwalk. Well connected to Lizzie Transform you into a Washington Internet takes on a whole new meaning. What is it? Well connected takes on a whole new meaning. Anybody who's connected to the internet all the time is simply more powerful. Alex Lightman, founder of a company called InfoCharm, he changed our name from InfoCharm to Charm to be more generic. Sometime soon. Most of these projects are research stages, but there's a tsunami wave of wearables coming onto the market. We're really going to be sharing thoughts with everybody almost in real time. That's the world we're heading for. So that was abbreviated version, the long, the segment on it. But we were the only company actually mentioned by name. Yeah, keep it going, because I want to show this. This is one of the better explanations. It's from a Canadian television station, if it's what I think it is. Oh, wait, there's something before it. All right, yeah, this is ZDNet, and then we'll go to the next one. Yeah, we'll just leave. Well, no, we'll, we'll leave it. So this is... Can you turn it up? Computers on the catwalk. High fashion meets high tech. High These designs are from Charm tech. Technology, a company that's pinning its hopes on wearable wireless net devices. Charm is a spin-off of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Media Lab. It provides the platform so customers can design their own personalized systems, from browsers to backlists, memory to metal. It consists of three parts, which is the base unit. Uh, we have the processor, and then you have input devices. You have many, many different selections and ways, and then you have computer screens. For example, this is one of them. You'll be able to view the internet, TV, video, DVD, anything that you do today, but you'll be able to do it uh, anywhere you are in the world. The application domain is completely open, so you know, we want to give software developers, you know, the time of their lives, and, you know, we have a lot of software developers also that want to play the games. Katrina Barilova expects to see this wireless mobile technology move smoothly into the mainstream. I was trained since I was 14 in security and investigations, so I used a lot of this technology for my previous work. And it fascinated that me, happens primarily nonsense, because I felt like I had advantage over other people since I had nonsense. access to any kind of information, anytime, anywhere. A few of these products will be available before the end of the year, and the cost, Charm Technology says, it plans to offer them similar to cell phone plans. So this next one is the, the Canadian thing, which I think is, um, we're, I, I promised uh, to talk about science fiction influences. Uh, I think that so many things in the modern world today come directly from someone reading science fiction magazines. We are interested in the future. Absolutely. After all, that is where we will spend the rest of our lives. So this is a Canadian show about technology in the future that focused on wearable computers. want to give people the Star Trek communicator only about 400 years sooner than the storyline calls for it. Another thing is the Babcom interface in Babylon 5. It's a back of the hand kind of thing. That's a wearable computer. The so I was just Tracy, talking about these things. It's funny about watch talking watch to, uh, capability. to people on a That's rooftop a wearable here. Computer. And then they went and found the footage. All this stock footage. We need wearable computers because we're all connected to the internet. So why should we have to be stuck at a desktop in our sweaty underwear while we're there for 12 hours at, in the office when we can go out, we can walk around, and we can do our work there? You don't have to have a computer on your desk like right here. You can have it in your watch, or in your jewelry, or in your purse, or in your shoes, or glasses. Whatever you choose to wear today, because it makes you feel more beautiful, or more comfortable, or makes you feel more cool, that's where your computer will be. This is a classic wearable. It consists of three parts. Your computer, computer monitor, and this is one-handed input device. Um, Input device can be, for example, this is from Light Glove, and what it does is it, it creates a, a grid of lights. 
And as you move your fingers through it, it recognizes the movement and the position. So you can do demonstrations, you can do typing, you can do presentations. Um, another type so of, the uh, of the fashion input is that it eventually gets smaller and smaller until it almost right? disappears. Or you can have what I'm going to show you with augmented reality is how all the technology is, uh, can be there and yet be completely invisible. On your jacket, invisible. on a sleeve, or on a napkin. This is an uh, example of fiber optics going in the clothes. I'm going to also show you some stuff about there. And uh, I appreciate you people with Star Trek Communicator. Oh yeah, you turn that up. About 400 years sooner than the storyline calls for it. Another thing is the Babcom interface in Babylon 5. It's the back of the hand kind of thing. Franklin. That's a wearable computer. The Dick Tracy TV wristwatch with detective capabilities. That's a wearable computer. Hey, the Borg on Star Trek, seven of nine. They are walking computers. They're both wearable computers and they're also nodes of a massive wireless network communicating back and forth with each other through uh, uh, an astonishing variety of frequencies I and protocols. I also think wearables are going to enable us to take much bigger risks. We'll be able to know temperature and pressure and altitude and all those things so we can go a little bit deeper into, uh, into space. We can go and colonize the moon, we can go over and terraform Venus and Mars. Wearables are going to be there and the wearables will constantly keep watch over us and say, okay, whoa, you know, you might That's not want to go out that airlock because you'll be sucked into space. So they found whatever I said, they would find some clip for it. I mean, I like is the idea that all of us can be safe. If you have video and audio on you all the time, who is going to mess with you? I mean, what, they would be basically right there. You have all the evidence you need to put them away. So gradually, criminally, criminals, or at least physical violence, will be weeded out of our society. I think that's a good thing. Second thing is we're going to be connected together. Each of us are going to be sharing our, our thoughts and experiences when we want to. Of course, we can always shut it off. There's no requirement we keep it on all the time. But at least to have that there as an option is incredible. Wearables are going to have a couple big impacts. First of all, wearables are going to decide who's cool and who's not. Just like, Just like right does. now, if you're on the internet, you're more cool than somebody who's not on the internet. There's nothing cool about being completely oblivious to the biggest social transformation of the last thousand years. Also, wearables are an equally big transformation. There's nothing cool about sitting in your bedroom, in your underwear, hacking away on the computer for hours and hours, passing little short messages. People have to go out. We're meant to be outdoors, in the sunshine and being out doing things. Okay, that's, thanks. Um, you can just turn off the sound. We can just let it run in the background. So, any questions? Okay, so science fiction uh, was invented by a teenager, teenage woman, in fact, who's, anyone know who that is? Mary Shelley? Uh, Mary Shelley wrote, right, wrote Frankenstein, exactly. About, uh, and at the time, the really cool thing that was happening there was this totally amazing thing happening called electricity. And she had read about an Italian professor, Galvani, who was making frog legs jump by introducing electricity. So she had a medical student, whose name was Frankenstein, go and assemble something and give it life by giving it electricity. And Mary Shelley then said, uh, uh, set up a, a, created a whole new kind of style of things, the Gothic tradition. And most people think of science fiction as growing out of that Gothic tradition. Edgar Allan Poe was one of the first science fiction people in America and wrote a lot about people being buried alive. And to some extent, that's what literature is. It's its way of entombing people's thoughts so that they can, you can go read about the Romans or Greeks or something in the future. And Jules Verne was the first real mass market science fiction guy. Anyone know what he did before he started writing science fiction? He was a stockbroker. So he said, hey, I've got an even bigger thing here. You know, and he, he knew that people wanted gold, so he wrote about giant gold asteroids striking the planet and so on. And one of the things that, that Jules Verne did was to create all these incredible technologies that people would use, including the Nautilus submarine. The very first submarine that the US sent out that went underneath the pole, nuclear-powered submarine, was called the Nautilus because of Jules Verne. Also, the very first shuttle that went out was the Enterprise. So we see science fiction impacting there. Jules, uh, uh, Jules Verne had a big impact on an Englishman who was partly contemporary called H.G. Wells. H.G. Wells was, in fact, the inventor of atomic power and the atomic bomb. He wrote a book called The World Set Free. And in The World Set Free, he talked about how we would stop this war, this big war through atomic weapons. And a, guy, a Hungarian guy named Leo Szilard, with S-Z-I-L-A-R-D, 
Leo Zillard was watching a traffic light and he realized how he could make H.G. Wells' vision come true. So he uh, met a friend of his that he was a co-inventor of, re of a refrigerator patent on. Anyone know who that was? Einstein, Albert Einstein helped to invent a refrigerator with Szilard, who said, hey, we had such a cool time working on the refrigerator thing, let's go have a hot time and let's go make an atomic bomb. Einstein says, I have no budget. He says, well, write your friend, the president. He'll, he'll listen to you, ask him for a billion dollars. So Leo Szilard ghost wrote a letter, Einstein gave it to him, they got their billion, they made the atomic bomb. It was pretty much that straightforward uh, from H.G. Wells. So back 20 years ago, almost to the day, somebody coined the term cyberspace. Anyone know who that was? Cyberspace. Do you know? Uh, yes, I knew you knew. You were just holding back. Like, like uh, Ben Affleck had said to Jennifer Garter, you're holding back. Well, don't. And, ah, okay. So the idea, William Gibson wrote that cyberspace was a consensual hallucination shared by billions of legitimate operators, lines of data receding off into infinity. And cyberspace didn't exist before he said that, but it was like a place to go to. And all of a sudden, because these people were wearing these kids, like gangs, like the big scientists, wearing trench coats and glasses and had Microsofts and stuff. He started talking about the fact that the street has its own use for thing and people could wear technology and they could be infused and implanted and imbued with technology. And then Neil Stevenson wrote a book called Snow Crash. And in it, he said that one out of every five people would be wearing cameras that were connected to the internet all the time. He called them gargoyles. Now, a few years uh, uh, after that, David Brin, or who went to UCSD, wrote a book called Earth. And in it, his senior citizens were called peepers. And they would wear wearable computers that had cameras all the time. So if you came up to do anything to them, to attack them, they would go, yeah, 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 because they could actually tease you because they were hooked in. And all their friends would call the cops and come at you and stuff. Hey, I'm going to get you, Sonny. So none of them had to worry about very much. And then you had people who started to wear, talk more and more about wearable computing until you wind up with Werner Vinge writing a story, Fast Times at Fairmont High. It's a story that's in his collected stories of Werner Vinge. And in it, kids who are in class, in fact, are in high school, are wearing wearable computers and doing augmented reality stuff all the time. So right now, here's where I see the technology going. Currently, we can do a lot with our cell phones. We can listen to them. But we have to use up a hand. We have to take a hand to make, uh, to basically be able to use them. And we have to type them in, so both of my hands are used. Now, if I can go over and I can attach a little Bluetooth clip, I have this thing here. If I take off the cord, then I can just have this there. But if I can sh shrink all this down until it's just fitting into some uh, kind of earpiece, then I have something that's wearable. But I still want to have something I can see with. So I think where things are going is towards the cameras. And right now, uh, 20 million camera phones have been sold. But 3G isn't deployed anywhere but Japan and Korea, and so you don't have the bandwidth there. So 3G is not deployed all over the world, but, and 2G is falling apart because so many people are selling cameras. Once the network capacity is in place, though, we have 802.11b, we have all this stuff everywhere, people are going to start carrying cameras on their phones, and then they're going to start carrying them on their wrists, and then they're going to start carrying them in their glasses or sunglasses, and we're going to be able to have a couple interesting advantages. One is that we're going to be able to see through the eyes of anyone who allows us to have their feed be online. So I'm wearing glasses here and I'm in this class. And let's say that there are some people in Beijing who would like to see what a UCLA class is, because they've everyone's heard of UCLA in Beijing. So all of a sudden, they could be seeing what I'm seeing here. Similarly, you might want to see what somebody is seeing in Kuwait. What's happening? Are there American army trucks rolling around there and stuff like that? then they can actually look out and see those things. So I think that this is one thing that's going to bring us closer together to a lot of people. Yes? Just to interrupt, what about language and customs? Well, there are a couple things here. One is that if you can do speech with, these, with systems that have about 800 megahertz per second, at least, um, yeah, you can just you can put it back at the beginning if you want. Um, if, you put, if you have a, a system that can do speech to text, you can then quickly and easily get that text translated into another language. Che text translation is free now. If you go to Google and you get an article in French, you can translate it to English, German, whatever you want. 
not very accurate. Well, sure. Oh, you, didn't, oh, you said accurate translation. Okay. That's a whole different thing. But it really it comes down to processing power. If you have a gigahertz or more in the new desktop systems that Dell is selling, anyone know what those are? What their top end is? Three gigahertz. So if you're basically at that level, two, three gigahertz, you can quickly do translation from English to French, though why anybody would want to speak to the French now, I don't know, just kidding. And, uh, or German or any other language, but basically a lot of people are putting a lot of money into this because it's a way to extend, it's a value added service. You know, have a certain cost of doing a phone call and you can have more, your phone call could cost 10 cents a minute more if you're allowing for translation between that. And these things can get actually pretty good, especially if it can follow you around and learn what you, learn more about you. Um, well, I was told though that most people in the, on the internet will be using Mandarin within four years something I heard recently. So I'd like the translation to work between English and Mandarin too. Okay, so now I'm gonna show you a videotape about what, uh, uh, which has to do with what some people who are fashion designers think is the future of this. Now this is even more far out than anything I've shown you today. Um, this is by Jenny Tillotson. And I want to show it to you to inspire you because this is something that she put together to work on her thesis. But once she had the video, she used it. She sent it to me and I hired her uh, to open up our London office because I was so impressed that she would do all this kind of thinking. And her idea is that wearable computers of the future should be more biological, a smart second skin. So we're going to look at this for a second. And I hope that uh, uh, you won't be too shocked because it does show, you know, a little red blessed vessels going through the capillaries and stuff like that. So if anyone's squeamish, uh, I'm sorry. What's that? What's that? Why, what happened? Oh, okay. Well, this woman, I will tell you, is crazy about smell. You know, she would go up to women at nightclubs until she finally had sniffed out the one that she wanted to marry. Oh, and uh, I'm not kidding. And she says that through smell, you can tell actually whether somebody is schizophrenic, whether they have AIDS, uh, all kinds of stuff. She swore it was true. And so what she thought that people should do, for instance, is that um, political candidates, hello. Oh, it's all right. What's that? Oh, well, you came back a little bit too soon. It's not running? Typical British quality. Yeah. Is it Pell? No, it's, I just played it on my own VCR at home. No? Okay. Well, I've decided not to show this to you because so I thought you'd be squeamish. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go over to... Uh, augmented reality. And if you could just rewind this one first. Thanks. Okay, so the idea behind augmented reality is that you have virtual reality and where you're inside the computer. And you have ubiquitous computing where you put computers everywhere in your environment. The idea of augmented reality is that you can have variable amounts of information that can come. So, for instance, right now, let's say it was really important for me to learn all your names. Um, like you were going to pay me a thousand dollars if I remembered your name or something, then I would have glasses on that would put your name above your head. It would, you know, I'm looking through it and it would overlay glasses uh, the 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 thing over your head. Now this is uh, this is part of the whole conversation about science fiction influences, but a bunch of people, often at the uh, a bunch of them at the University of Washington saw Star Wars, and some people say, oh, Lucas does this, Lucas should do that. They said, okay, how do I do what I saw in the movie? And many of them were inspired by the chess game that uh, Chewbacca was playing with Han Solo, you know, where they have these little tiny kind of holographic characters. And they also were surprised when they saw Darth Vader able to send his image, a holographic full body image, over across space. So they determined to try to make that. So another thing that people, uh, these, are the, these are three influences on Charm's way of looking at it. This is what we're starting to do. And then I'm going to show you some augmented reality stuff. Uh, we've been hired by Disney to do some stuff. You're leaving now? This is a, this is a crucial moment. And, okay, so can you turn on the sound? 
target. So this is his augmented reality vision for RoboCop. These are little vignettes of of, uh, of three mo uh, four movies One, that are two, all augmented reality. Three. Uh, Record. But I. No, this is what I see people doing in the future. Now play back. Bring it up 50%. Give me a full frame. Got it. All right, clear out. What are your prime directives? Serve the public trust, protect the innocent, uphold the law. That's good. That's very good. Support Tom Ridge for Secretary of Homeland Security. Huh? <laughs> huh? So he's looking through the wall. Wouldn't you like to be able to look through walls? I think that would be cool as hell. Nobody ever takes me seriously! Well, get serious now! I kissed the mayor's ass goodbye! See, that's what you can do when you have augmented vision. So... Arnold goes shopping for clothes, boots, and a motorcycle. Some of you probably remember this. There he is, the naked man of Pacific Palisades. <laughs> you ever seen him in real life? Any of you run into him? He eats at Montana Cafe, Montana quite often. All right, scan mode, acquire transportation. He's looking at the models, he's looking at the car, Harley Davidson, Harley Davidson, model number, ah, suitable. Okay, scan mode, level 35 priority, acquire clothing. So he's in the bar. There's a Maori from New Zealand here in America. There he comes in naked, the women all smiled, men look at him hot, with hostile look. Ah, mesomorph, okay, squire size, size assessment, nope, she's a little too small, ectomorph. This bar is in L.A. I challenge you to find it. Endomorph. So he's doing his thing. Ooh, she says. Endomorph. Height. Ah, there we go. Look at that. Scanning, let's see. Ooh, the boots look good. Match, all measures, level 58 scan, match. Okay. Match.com is doing $180 million. They should have something like this. Your your boots. And your motorcycle. <laughs> you need your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. Okay, Fight Club, augmented reality retail interface. Among so many others, I had become a slave you turn up the to sound the IKEA it? nesting. This is an example that's the closest yeah, thing to what we're doing with Eric, it, and I'll show you an example. Dust ruffles. If I so saw he's ordering it, and then he's imagining he's walking into the IKEA catalog, had to have it. coming to life in his own apartment. Personal you guys all seen this? Unit. The Fight Club is, a, is an augmented reality movie. The, the whole movie, he's doing augmented reality. He's even making Brad Pitt even augmented reality. There, I spoiled it for you. Friendly, unbleached paper. I'd flip through catalogs so he's overlaying. So imagine you could walk around the whole world and see the person. story behind things, where they came from. And then this is our, our sort of model of what you can do with the glasses once you have them. Now, no glasses like this exist right now. The processing power required to do this would, re you know, render things like this Morning. would be too hot. Your but they're coming. You choose to accept it involves recovery of a stolen item designated Chimera. You may select any two team So to me, this is the future of computing. There's just no doubt in my mind. She is a civilian, a highly capable professional. And when you're wearing them, the world Before rotates you around you. Seville to receive your assignment. As always, should you or any member of your armed force be caught or killed, the secretary will dispel. Yes, well. that's true. Well, we will when we have all we all have all. I'll have the glasses. Next time you go on holiday, and there's a group in San Diego uh, under Mohan Trivedi, which have found a way that if you're tracking an object, to switch the cameras automatically once it's locked onto the object. So in fact, we can track them. Okay. So, uh, that's what I have here. Now I can show you, sorry? Yeah, laptop. Yeah. Okay, any questions so far? No? Are you guys special because you get to sit there? Are you like king and queens for a day? No? 
because uh, you look so so. Look at how they're they're dramatically lit, like fashion models. All right, here we go. Okay, million dollar search. Wow, as soon as I got on your system, it's spamming me. Look at all the spam UCLA has given me since I got here. Is that how they're sub keeping your tuition low? Is they're doing advertising to students? All right, now here is some augmented reality stuff. Any of you seen augmented reality? Raise your hand if you've seen it before. Okay, I think you're gonna like it. All right, so this is the view of a person going into a book and he is he is going to be at his book and on his on the left page you'll see that he has um, oh, it's too loud. Okay. oh yeah thanks so he's picking up something on this page here on the left side are the two images and on the right side here there are little black squares and on this thing over here there are little black squares and he's picking up something He's looking at it, and he's through it, okay? So it looks like he's just basically moving a piece of paper on a piece of paper. And it's making sounds as he's doing that. Now I'm going to show you what he's actually seeing. Curious, isn't it? Very curious. There's actually been a shift in terminology from augmented to mixed reality because this is a perfect example where it's both. Yeah. Rather than looking through a kind of a VR system where, where what you see is augmented all the way. Yeah, you know but I mean? the, the whole mixed reality thing, it doesn't really tell you anything because reality itself is mixed. So I, I didn't buy it. It's, a, it's more the Americans like AR and the Japanese like MR, you know. All right, so here's what it looks like if you look at what he's looking through in his glasses. Those, remember those black squares? They now have these three <laughs> objects on him, and he's able to pick up and move the object around. And then as you tilt it, it sort of has an underlying physics in it. And notice how when you, when you run your mouse over something to click on it in the web, this is a 3D object that can be hyperlinked to <laughs> anything else and come up and see it. And if you go through walls, it makes a buzzing sound just so that you know that they're there. And so that you, this person who's a designer can actually go into a whole apartment this way. You could very easily imagine a little girl who had glasses and was playing Barbies, has her little naked Barbie, and then imagines that it has a ballroom dress. And then there's a can there and imagines it has a tuxedo on. And then these dolls can come to life and run around, do cars and stuff, and they're all based on the tangible user interfaces of the dolls themselves. Now you just saw an image there where you picked something up and flipped it. That's, that's what it looked like to him when he was doing it. He's going to put that down and he's going to smack it. And that's a, another way of getting, getting rid of the, the object. And we, have, we are the ones who made this technology mobile. So before, the, uh, before we worked with University of Washington and uh, uh, Osaka University, you had to just use this on a desktop, but we set it up so that you could do it in a mobile application as you moved your head, it would overlay it onto the real world. We were also the first people to do this commercially. We did this uh, for, for Hollywood Records, for Duran Duran. We made a whole thing where we had every song, there was an augmented reality thing that would appear on the screen behind it. So Simon Le Bon would be singing about hallucinating Elvis. And it would be shot, so there'd be like a shot of me. But then in this shot, there'd be Elvis dancing with me. So we can insert things, any image into any other image in real time as if it's really there. Now, one thing that's interesting is that you can drop an object on top of another object. So notice that it thinks that there's a table there. So you can move it on top of it. And you can also smack it and erase it, but just erase the top object and not the one underlying it. So there's some pretty interesting physics behind this whole thing. And my thought is in the future that we will have people who have augmented reality displays and say, okay, every time I see a person wearing black, make them wearing a television screen showing ABC. And every time I see a person wearing 
bright, uh, dark yellow and have that person be showing CNN. And so whatever we're looking at, it's automatically laying things onto things, over things. <laughs> All right, there's another interesting thing here too, which is imagine that you have someone's business card. Let's say you have my business card, and you could turn it over, and all of a sudden a video window would pop up, and I could talk to you, or vice versa. Download PC Booster here. No thank you. So pop up this piece of paper, and up pops a live video window on top of the piece of paper. So this is something we're going to be doing is we're going to be having messages around us. Like we could have clothing that had a screen in it that just showed a little square. But if you had the camera to decode it, it could actually make it look like we had a cloud of angels around us or a halo over our head or wings behind us. But I think that, so I show this to you because technology and fashion, my point is that everything we have is fashion now, you know, what's that? Yeah, it is. Yeah, all right. All right, I'll start it over here so you can see. So the idea is that in the future, when you're looking at something, is that better? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yes, if you want to have it this way. However, what you could do is you could have a laptop um, and you could have a camera here, like a webcam. And so I could point it at you, and then I could have it over there. But yes, you have to have a screen between you and the thing you're being, you're looking at. Yes. It's not a hologram. So. Here is um, a thing that, imagine that you're trying to get around Los Angeles and you have a Thomas Brothers guide. You're here on UCLA campus for the first time. You could have the map of UCLA campus or of Westwood and something that says, show me where the classrooms are or show me the traffic. And by putting a piece of paper on top of a piece of paper, it would go over to this database of gigabytes worth of data and it would overlay it so that this now will take on terrain characteristics. And now there's a little block of terrain that just goes through the database and pulls out that one thing and overlays the paper. Now imagine you went to a computer and you had to find that through Google. Okay, what do you search on? Well, let's say that that's Washington State. You type in Washington State, maps. You see what I mean? You have to type all this information. But by simply putting a piece of paper on a piece of paper, it gives you all the contextual information that you need. So when we're talking about how we can get more people onto the internet, this is the way. Now here's that thing will now change. And now there's a, something that you could fly up and down. You can see the person going through the whole map that way. Now I said before that we're getting to the point where we can do without the devices. So here's an example of that. This is a person moving a hand and the camera in the glasses is doing edge detection. Now by the way, the camera can be anywhere. This is not using the glasses. There's no glasses necessary here. But you just as long as you have the camera, so by moving your, your finger like that, it's the equivalent of clicking and even double clicking. So here, move the file down here, and we'll go in in a second and open a paint program, you know, double clicking, as if you're double clicking on the file, and then go in and go and do some painting. Well, this is called virtual, <laughs> unbelievable. Oh yeah, that's right, you could take off the internet. Well, we'll leave it on for a second. because. Um, so the idea here is a paint program. So you can basically move your hand around and do it. So in the future, you could have, as long as you have the camera, the camera could be here, or the camera could be here, you could say, go like this. And it would automatically make a virtual cell phone and see where you were putting your finger, and then relatively, it would uh, go and dial that phone number. Hello, how are you? And you would, you know, then you'd really look weird because you would have no, Cords, no phone, no nothing, but you'd be talking on the cell phone because the computer is getting all the information from the way you move your hands. Go like this, and you'd be typing away. Go like that, and you'd be playing a trumpet. Go like that, and you'd be playing the drums, you know, and so on. So you don't actually have to even have all the equipment at some point. 
And that's why I think that cameras will be woven in to almost everything. Cameras are the future of fashion. Okay, so those are slides. Then I'm gonna show you one more little thing here, which is magic book stuff. Oh, no, that's not it, no. Here we go, magic book immersion. All right, so here's a book, good example of mixed reality. You have a book, and as you open each page in the book, it pops up a little tiny city or scenario there. And there are a couple things. There's the book level. You just see the pictures in the book. There are the augmented reality view, and then there is the immersive reality or the virtual reality view. So you could go in to this tea house and walk around the garden and see Fujiyama off in the background. Have you seen Fujiyama in real life? No? Oh. Okay, so here it is. And then you can go inside it. So now this is what you're seeing. You've now converted from a physical worldview to an AR view to a virtual reality view. And this is what you were saying was mixed reality. This is a good example of that. So this stuff looks a little bit more realistic when you look at it from this angle as from when it's a small, tiny thing. So imagine children who want to play army who want to play doctor, who want to play magic chef, or whatever, they can actually imagine, with the little tiny toys that they have, that those toys are, are surrounded by a world of context all around them. Is this an MIT project? Uh, this, that particular one I just showed was from University of Washington. So, any questions? Okay. So what I wanted to talk to you about now in conclusion, um, then we can talk about anything you want. I, I can stay longer if you want. But basically, fashion is going to change because one of the things about fashion is it creates a unique look. You know, you can change the color, you can change the style, you can change the texture, but What's really interesting to me is what happens when the next stage, um, you had put up as a link, Luminex. I contacted them, I want to, uh, it's 200 bucks for a pillowcase, but I sure want one. You know, isn't that romantic? Imagine coming in, your pillowcases are, and your sheets are glowing. Wow, that's amazing. Um, Catherine Zeta-Jones says to use white rose petals instead of red ones, because red ones make it look like a chainsaw massacre. But imagine you have the ability to have that. Well, the next stage beyond that is that you have flexible screens. So imagine the bed can look like it's covered by roses. And it can look like it's a pool of water. Then it can look like it's covered with, you know, I don't know, rabbit fur or whatever. But the idea is it can look like anything. And you have the ability also, imagine you could wear clothes. Like the students who are coming to this class in three years will be wearing clothes that will have the ability to put images on them. They can have TV images, they can have flowers rotating around and stuff. But to me, the fact that everyone's going to have a camera on their body, on their eyes, everyone is going to have a screen on their torso or their butt or their legs or wherever. Everyone is going to have sensors which will sense their heart rate and in fact could even sense the heart rate of someone else. So let's say that I want to um, have you be really pumped up for a football game or whatever, you know, some sport or something like that. I could then have something, the image that would, that would make you get pumped up or excited or whatever. You know, in other words, you could have images that are appropriate to that person in that context at that moment. I think that that's one of the things that's the future of fashion. Another thing is, what happens when you have six billion people who are online pretty much all the time? You're going to need immediately, as you said, translation. You're going to be talking, you're going to be chatting, you're going to be messaging all the time. But the sort of um, Gutenberg galaxy, you know, this whole explosion that was set off when Gutenberg invented the printing press will happen because each one of us will have incorporated a mainframe computer capability, a telephone central switching office capability, um, a, you know, like a hazmat team full of sensors onto our body. We're going to be like a TV broadcasting studio. All these things will be on us personally. And the challenge of people working in technology and fashion is to make that kind of thing look good and on the one hand design new things and on the other hand put it in a context where it makes odd stuff look kind of cool rather than look freakish and weird and different. 
Because throughout history, people resist things that are new. New equals weird. That's, that's how it's been through most of history. And so the challenge is how do you take technology and put it on the body? How do you put it into someone's sense of style? And you know, you've seen some of the answers today. You use fashion shows, you use augmented reality, you use rock concerts, you use maps, toys, all those kind of things. But I guess the main thing to do is just to look at you know, wearable computing, augmented reality, and all this kind of stuff. The last thing I would mention about this is the importance of learning about IPv6. IPv6, who here has heard of IPv6? Okay, Leah. Good job, Leah. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, sure. Okay. It's going to make people. Uh, well, we could put the video thing back on with all the background stuff, if you want. So just put this is the one which has the which runs the longest. Yeah. So IPv6 is the next internet. I, internet Protocol version six. IPv6 is just basically a stack that you put in routers, but you also configure your website. Why does everyone need IPv6? Well, one reason is that the address space that we have is melting. Only about 35% of all the addresses are left, and they're being eliminated about one per month. But it's like many things. Let's just say that all of a sudden people realize that, uh, that there was some property in Westwood. And all of a sudden, then you, you, after one week, you couldn't buy the property more. So eventually, when somebody bought it, you can't buy any more property. Everybody would try to buy it. Well, if everyone thought that the addresses were running out, everybody would quickly go and say, oh, well, give me 10 million addresses. I need them for the future. And so IPv6 gives you uh, many more addresses. It also gives you more security. Um, it gives you greater mobility. And it gives something that's just pretty interesting, which is end-to-end. -end. You need kind of end-to-end -end uh, ability to do this communication. For instance, if I'm going to do voice over IP, I need to have an end-to-end -end capability. I can't go through um, a network address translation, which is called a NAT. So as you're talking and thinking about this stuff, you know, try to get some work in with IPv6. It's free. It's not owned by any one company. Nobody controls it. It's just like the internet itself. But it's going to be very useful because the average person is going to be, you know, having 100, email, uh, 100 internet addresses because of IPv6. So that's my, my basic formal uh, presentation. Uh, questions or anything that you'd like to discuss? Any ideas you'd like to talk about? Oh, sure. Thanks. Yes? Okay, I was wondering how big are the glasses now? Like, what the the with the screen, like the augmented reality? How how small have you gotten it? Well, I'm they're sorry. the size that you saw. Remember the first one, that apartment one? They're about like this. Okay. Uh, but but they require you to have either a desktop computer or a laptop or one of these. This is a Charmit. This is the smallest we've been able to get a full featured desktop system running. Now, when I say how big are the glasses, I'll actually let you try them on if you like. So they can be this size. And then you'd like to have, Leah, can you come and help me unravel all these things? I packed everything in here. But basically it comes down to, to uh, oh, here we go. If you could just separate these cords out for me. So I just take this here. This is a tiny monitor. And I can snap it in here. Now this doesn't give you the full on, you know, like that tea house. This is not going to completely obscure your view like the other ones will. Okay. But this is enough to see a screen. So this is, as, this is pretty much as small as it gets, if you want to see that. If you want to try it on, go ahead. And you can see the weight of it. And what that, what that includes is a wearable computer and a little optical, optical thing with a power supply. And then this is the wearable computer itself. Don't drop it, but if you want to pass it around, this just weighs about a pound and a half. And that will do everything that a, that a desktop computer will do. And it has lots of ports and slots. You know, several, uh, four USB ports, 100 megabits per second Ethernet, all that kind of stuff are there. And this is a Twiddler, if anyone would like to try out the Twiddler and see. Uh, yeah, you'll realize it's not nearly as nasty as it sounds. Uh, OK, so. We'll pass the start to just make sure that we just follow these around, make sure that I get them back. Okay. Um, here, would you like to start looking at this since you were laughing about the Twiddler earlier? <laughs>
Okay, um, yes, question. Where? What's your name? I'm feeling like I'm getting to know you. I'm sorry, Chad. <laughs> what's it? Chad. Like Chad, hi yes, Chad. Yes, nice to meet you. Um, where and how are you guys marketing these? Like to which specific groups of people are you marketing them to? In the beginning, we're marketing it to universities, to government research people, to homeland defense people, and to uh, hospitals that do research. For instance, the VA hospital is what we're doing our project for the blind. It's called Cyber Crumbs, like Hansel and Gretel laying down the crumbs in the forest. And we just got a, a notification of a, a grant to go and take our software to the next level for working with the blind. And so it, that's the initial phase. There's a, there's a basic idea that in marketing technology, you have the innovators, the first 1% of the whole market, then the early adopters who are 2%, and then there are, uh, there's the early mainstream, and then there's the late mainstream. And so right now, we're just selling to that 1% innovator market, which is tiny. But you know, if we succeed there, then we'll have some stories. And then the people who want to be the first to own something will do that. Where's the charm at? Where is it? Oh, there it is. OK. okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure, because that, that cost $2,000. I want to make sure I get it back. So. Have you worked with Steve Mann? I know Steve Mann, and I communicate him by, with, with him by, by email maybe five, five, ten times a week. Is that uh, right? Yeah, and uh, he's, uh, he's very big on cameras, very, very not so big on making it look fashionable. Is that so? Yeah, why do you ask? I've been in shows with him, and I know his work over the yeah. years. Well, he, uh, he doesn't have the, the best relationship with my co-founder, Thad. And so they, they, both of, me, both of them talk, tell me not to talk to the other one. So, but Steve is, Steve is really the pioneer as far as wearable cameras. Thad is really the pioneer as far as wearable text entry and output and searching. So they each have their thing, but when they try to claim the whole field of wearable computing, that's when, it get, that's when the, their academic disputes come into play. Are they both based on MIT? No, they both left MIT. Thad Starner went to run the program at Georgia Tech. Steve Mann went back to his native Canada to run the program at University of Toronto. Yes, here's your chance. This is what I have to say also. I want to, I want to point something out. I was just at a conference in Tokyo, and I was there for a week, Monday, through Friday, for, for all day long. And that entire week, there were people from all over. Do you know how many questions someone from Asia asked that entire week? Not a single one. So there's a cultural thing which prevents you, maybe people from asking questions. So what I'd like is for you to ask a question, because you need the practice. Go ahead, ask a question, anything at all. Okay. There's no bad question. Because there's a, it's in, a, in American culture, it's really important to, 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 to be, have people be willing to hear you. Yes. OK, go ahead. Um, so I just wanted to ask you, like, um, so you talk about you know, the positive thing about all those new technology. And you, you, told, you told about uh, how you have to show you know, in a seductive way you know, for the marketings. A what way? Um, in show a what way? Seductive way. Seductive way? Mm -hmm. I didn't use the word seductive. You didn't use the word seductive, but that's, I mean, I'm maybe misunderstanding. Well, you say you have to, when you say you have to show it in a seductive way, no, you don't. But you should show it in a way so that people will watch it. If you have an idea that uses it in a different way, you know, you should use that. Okay, so I think the word is seductive. <laughs> Sorry. So I wanted to ask you, like, what was your, you know, philosophy about how the technology can make things better or, you know, why you want to put glasses, little glasses, why you want to put little screens? I mean, you know, the why, I mean, how sure. well, you make it better? Well, it's, if you look at, at the evolution of humanity, you see that we have gotten, we went from, we used to be like little, little raccoons. You know, I mean, basically, if you believe in evolution, many fundamentalist Christians don't believe that, so let's set that aside for a second. But even if you, were, you know, did believe there was no evolution, there would still be something about seeing things. Well, one of the things that we did was we stood up. And so by standing here, we could look out, just like little meerkats, you know, little creatures from South Africa. They look out. They're looking all around. And there are always one of them out there looking around. So my thought is that we want to be safe, right? There's a Maslow's hierarchy of needs. There's security. So if each of us has a camera and each of us can warn another person, then that's a good thing. And if we have to wear a camera, we don't want the camera just recording everything we see all the time. We want to have it just record certain things. That means we need controls. And that's what a computer does. A computer gives us that control. 
So I think that that's, that's a, a fundamental thing. But 70% of our brain, I've heard, is given over to information processing. And if we can put a computer on there looking at images all the time using Google search engines and so on, it can make us healthier, it can make us wealthier, it can make us wiser, it can make us have more friendships. Um, there's a really good book called The Tipping Point. And in there, the author talks about the fact that, that uh, for instance, certain kinds of animal brains, the animals can get along, like meerkats. They can get around along in groups of like 7 to 20. And that a chimpanzee can have a group of like 50. You know, and that uh, Homo neanderthalus could have a group of around 100 he could remember. And that as our brains get bigger, we can keep more and more relationships. Well, with someone has, if someone has a palm pilot, they can probably keep track of more people. Oh, I made this appointment with this person. I made this promise to that person. Um, I, I have this, you know, this thing I need to collect, get these people, three people involved in. They could probably have relationships with more people. And if you have something that has somebody's picture or a video clip and it has a recording of the meeting, then you could have maybe a relationship with 500 or 1,000 people. I have probably 10,000 people I know because they have their business cards. And what I find is that I just simply forget things. You know, if I don't have some way of keeping track of it all the time. The best system I know for keeping track of this is what Thad Starner has. He will have his glasses and his camera, and he'll have his twiddler in his left hand. Where's the twiddler? Can someone, who's got the twiddler? Okay, so she's got the twiddler. So Thad will, will sit there in a meeting, and he'll have this on there, and he will, so type in your name on the business card. He's got his computer linked up through 802.11b or a cellular modem card. You know, you can get a cell phone on a card. And he'll go and type your name in. He'll be talking to you, making small talk, and he'll look you up on Google. And then he'll, like, if he's not sure whether it's you or somebody, like, let's say your name is John Smith. Well, there's going to be a bunch of them. So he'll, oh, really, what? Well, where did you go to high school? You know, or something like that. And all of a sudden, he'll start looking you up, and then he'll know what to talk about. So it's very funny, but conversations with Thad seem to never, he, she's got a little display there, uh, never seem to, to end because you can always look up one more topic that's of interest. And if you have someone like me, I've published about half a million words or so. There's so many things that you could read about me and know about me that there's always something to talk about. So that's a couple of the reasons I like wearables. Yes, in the back row. Campus events. We're streaming. You have to put the mic up. Well, some of those options that you're talking about seem very obvious and are just a matter of curiosity. And a person could just ask you to talk about those things. Why do you think that knowing this beforehand will prepare you for a better conversation or a better interaction? Well, if you had a wearable now, what, what do you know about me? What could you tell me about myself right now? Don't be hating. <laughs> I don't think that's the point, though. I mean, I can just ask you anything I want to know. Well, if you want to get it to that level, this is, a, this is the, that funny sort of thing that you do in universities where you go, well, why? Why? It's, it's sort of the, ver the adult version of the terrible twos. And so I could ask you, you know, you're in a fashion class. So look at her. She looks hot. Look at that, that vest and stuff. And look at your t-shirt. You're both wearing clothes. Neither of you are naked. But why look good? Well, part of the reason to look good is the whole reason for fashion. You know, look at her. She's wearing that little neck thing that looks there. So you don't have to know very much. You can always get by on a very basic level enough to just sort of do it. You can look, you can basically know very little about someone. And you can go, hi, hi, I see you now. But if you want to follow up, like, if, like for instance, I went to a conference in Japan. And I said, by the way, if anyone wants my book, I'll send it to them. Well, to my horror, 104 people came up to me and asked me to send them a book. Leah will confirm this. And so I had to send a book and a letter to all those people. Now, I just sent them all the same letter. But if I'd had my act together, if I'd actually taken notes during the time I'd had a conversation and I'd remembered something and I just put it in there, I could have customized that letter. So I'm asking them for help, for relationship, whatever. If you can go over and have some personal note there, um, well, look at, look at who's in charge of the gun train right, right now. It's George W. Bush. He's there in large part because his father was president. You know how his father got to be president? His father would go and write a personal thank you note to everyone he met. It was even in Doonesbury. You know, it's like, Mr. President, can I, can I have a decision on this thing? You know, no, I'm writing you a thank you note. 
And so, so much of life, and this is the, something that I, I have never met a college student who understood this, so much of life is who you know and how much they like you, and so much of how much people like you is do you have follow-up? After you meet them, after you talk to them, do you send them some kind of personal note? Now imagine, you're going to a campus, you're going to probably meet a thousand people this year. If you're in business and you go to conferences and you give talks and stuff, you know how many people you meet? You meet maybe 500 people at a conference. And let's say you go to a conference every week. I mean, do the math. What are we talking about? 25,000 people that you meet in a year? There's no way, unless you take notes right on the spot, you're going to be able to have any follow-up with those kind of people. So that's my, that's, my, that's my answer to why you can't just do it you know, with your mind. Because people, nobody can remember that much. I don't care who you are. Yes? Are any of the things that you've invented, are they out in the market? Or have you yeah, sold Yeah, sure, them? that Charmit. If you want to buy a Charmit today, the, the CPU is $2,000. The display, the little glasses thing is $9.95. And this is $200. But since you're from UCLA, I'll give you a 10% <laughs> discount. Yes, you can buy it today. We'll ship yeah, it to you. Can buy that too. Yeah, you can buy it today. Sure, all these things are available. You like the mouse? Sure, you can buy something like that. Yeah, no, the mouse, the, the, uh, that little mouse is, is there. And the idea then is to take Bluetooth and make wireless. Come on, grab that mic. You're already on center stage. You're positioned for a question. You're looking down upon the rest of the class. Go ahead, ask a question. OK, any other questions here? Yeah, that's the little mouse she has, right, with the, without the cable. Any questions? Yes. The lady with the flower in her hair, yes. Pardon me? How much, how much is the mouse? 50 bucks. Can, can you just like walk into any store and get it? Or do we Pardon to, me? Do we have to specially order it through your company? Or yeah. Yeah, I mean, do you, do you get like commission? <laughs> well, I own the company, so I, 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 um, I don't get a commission, but I, you know, I get to stay in business, which is always a good thing. Did you all in the back see this? Okay, great. Another question? Yes. No? Okay, do you have a question? No. No. Well, you're wearing an athletic thing. Would you like to know how they're used for athletics? Okay, great. <laughs> Much All right, well, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> All right. One more applause. <laughs> and then let's clap for you. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. So if anybody is interested, uh, this is the book. Hey, look at this. Look at the little advertisement. Oh, they don't have it here. I can just put it up here. Look at what the advertisement that got sent through. Watch and record everything. You know, these little X10 cameras. Leah, can you pack up the wet laptop? OK, I've enjoyed myself. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it. And uh, please read my book if you want to know more. Thank you. Tell every professor in every class that you would like to